on this computer. Okay. We're go. Okay, everybody. Hello, and you're all very welcome. I'd like to introduce you all to Bill Schwarzo. Bill, of course, as you can see here on the slide, is um, Chief Innovation Officer at Hitachi Bantara. He's also an honorary professor at the National University of Ireland Galway, which some of you might know quite well. Uh, Bill has been a really frequent visitor to the campus in recent years, a great contributor to the IS program in particular. In Galway rather than from his home in California, but uh, unfortunately, that, that's not possible. So, we're grateful for, for Bill and his time here today. And just to let you know, Bill is actually the author of three books one, the Big Data, Understanding How Big Data Powers Big Business, and his second book was The Big Data MBA, and his third and most recent book was The Art of Data Science. Today and then like a little bit more around um, systems for harm. So with Martin, I think, to get all think that? I lost you there. And okay, we we'll just missed my introduction then. All right. Well, let me go ahead and get started, and hopefully, I'm coming th coming through loud and clear. Am I yeah. good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So. In 1805, Lord Nelson, who was the admiral for the British fleet, faced a almost impossible task, which was he had to stop the combined armada of Spain and France from leading Napoleon's invasion of England. Now, back in those days, battles were pretty much determined by firepower, how many cannons and how fast you could load them. And pound the other side. And to do that, what you would see is in these naval battles, these ships would line up face to line up across each other. And the naval fleet that had, again, the most cannons and could reload more quickly, were directed by one admiral at the middle who used flags to help direct the, the onslaught. And the battle was pretty easily determined. Again, the economic value here was determined by how many cannons you had and how fast you could reload them and how much damage you could administer to the other side. Lord Nelson, unfortunately, had far inferior manpower, firepower, and technology, and knew that if he attacked them using traditional methods, it'd be a very poor outcome for the British and for the country of England. So what he decided to do was in order to change the game, he reframed his strategy. Right. He reframed how he thought about it. And what he decided to do was instead of, look, um, instead of attacking front on, he decided to line up his ships in a line and charge at the middle of the Spanish-French Armada line. Now, what that meant is that the ships at the front were going to get pounded mercilessly by the cannons but they would be able to penetrate through this. And the idea was to attack the command and control structure of the Spanish Armada by, by breaking them up. And Lord Nelson won the battle. In fact, um, not only did he not lose a single ship, but he administered about 80% of casualties or damage of ships on the Spanish and French Armada, that is, they lost about 80% of their ships. And so a lot of, a lot of the um, credit for his victory goes in his, his fact that he reframed his strategy and how he approached the attack. But the real key for what he did was unlike the command and control structure of the Spanish Armada, where one person in the middle was directing all the activities using flags, and once that person was cut off and or killed, the Armada had no head. What Lord Nelson had done is he had instructed each of his ships to operate independently. He had empowered each of these teams to work independently. And once they had broken through, they created mass chaos, which worked to their advantage. Each of their ships individually were able to create massive damage on the other ships. And as I said before, not only did they win the battle, 
but they won it in a stunning fashion, not just because of their approach and their strategy, but because Lord Nelson had empowered each of his teams independently to operate independent of each other once the battle started. <laughs> By the way, the, the interesting little factoid here, Lord Nelson himself was killed in the battle. And he was killed by the one person on the French-Spanish Armada side who was not being directed by the, the Admiral on their side. He was killed by the only person who was geared to operate independently, a French sniper. So what we're going to talk about today is digital transformation, but the importance, the importance of how teams do this. Now, when we talk about digital transformation, there's some aspects about digital transformation that we're going to talk about through the presentation. And hopefully, you can see me right in here on the flip chart. There's some aspects of digital transformation I want us to embrace and we're going to talk about. And we're going to come back to team empowerment time and time again, because each of these different aspects here in of themselves are not sufficient. So the first part of digital transformation is always about data and data science. And in particular, how organizations are leveraging things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, to really create new sources of value. Today's digital transformation is driven by organizations' ability to get value out of their data. But to do that requires organizations to take on a whole new approach, design thinking, which is really forcing organizations to deeply and intimately understand their customers. Let's understand, this is really clear here. The only source of value an organization has is its customers, because they're the only people, as I like to say, with ink in their pen. They're the ones who are making the decisions. So it, data science without a design thinking, customer-centric perspective sets you up for failure. There's also another aspect here. And that's all around how you create value, what we call value engineering, which is all really geared around the concepts of economics. So digital transformation today is being driven by these three different variables, data and data science, which is all about artificial intelligence, machine learning, design thinking, which is about an intimate understanding of customers, sources of value and value creation, and then economics that drives all that. But much like Warren Nelson showed that his strategy alone is not sufficient, that organizations need to empower teams. And so we're gonna talk about this empowerment of teams throughout the process here. We'll come back to these, but it's, it's all framed around how organizations empower their teams. So we know digital transformation is happening across a wide range of areas. Sorry, I gotta miss it. We see, for example, in the consumer space, we see time and time again that technology, while very powerful, isn't alone, isn't sufficient in winning these battles. In fact, the interesting thing about the data science technologies, all the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, is the vast majority of them are open source. Hadoop, TensorFlow, Keras, you know, Kafka, Spark, all this stuff is open source. So you can't win the game based on technology. In each of these cases here in the customer space or consumer space, we saw organizations embrace teams that were able to leverage data and drive innovation. But it isn't just in, the, in this commercial space. I have to go to this bar, I guess. It's also here, now we're seeing it in the industrial in commercial spaces as well, where all these organizations are under attack. The digital transformation is attacking all these industries, that the way you've done battle in, in the past has not working. The old command and control style of how organizations have operated that was embedded courtesy of World War II in, this, in the 80s and our 50s and 60s is now being replaced by empowered teams. And so let's talk about how organizations are doing this and what are the aspects of it. So the first part, if you want to drive team empowerment, the very first point of it is you need to make certain you have a common mission across the organization, that everybody organization knows what it is they're trying to achieve and how is value created. 
So here are some very common mission statements, right? 3M to solve unsolved problems innovatively or Merck to preserve and improve human life. I hope they're very busy today with the coronavirus. Uh, Walmart has their one to make ordinary people, you know, feel like they're rich. Um, Disney, you know, make people happy. We have one as well. As an organization, we have a mission statement as well, and it's pretty simple. How do we help organizations become more effective at leveraging data and analytics to power their business? Very clear what we're trying to accomplish, right? All about data and analytics. How do we help organizations leverage their data and analytics, but how do we do that and frame it in a way around how it drives their business models? This is, we call this our big data business model maturity index, and this guides the conversations we have with our customers. This helps us meet the customers where they are on this transformational path and put in place processes and guidance to help them move along that path, to become much more efficient, to move from just reporting and monitoring data to predicting, to prescribing, to automating, to monetizing. And at the end of this, how do you drive autonomous industries? How do you drive autonomous practices? How do you create autonomous products? This process is important because everybody in the organization knows what it is we're trying to accomplish. Our mission statement lays it out. But without the how aspect of how we're creating value, that mission statement doesn't carry any weight. It's got no legs. And so what we have is we have a value engineering approach that we take with our customers, which starts with us understanding what their business initiatives are. That is, what is it they're doing to create value? It, you might be a theme park. And you're trying to reduce unplanned operational downtime. You might be a, a manufacturer trying to reduce inventory costs. You might be a bank trying to reduce customer attrition. Right? We focus on where the sources of value are in the organization. Then we bring in the key stakeholders. These are the customers of the process. Those are the people who either impact or are impacted by that initiative. And the real key for us is to focus on the use cases, which for us is, um, think of them as, as um, aggregated series of decisions. A use case is basically an aggregation of decisions. And I won't go into decisions here because decisions are important from a data science perspective, but from a business perspective, it's all about those individual use cases and understand um, you know, which ones do we go after. And here's the challenge we have in this process, the opportunity as well is that organizations don't fail because of lack of use cases. They fail because they have too many. So you need a process to go through, a methodical process to identify, validate, value, and prioritize those use cases vis-a-vis -vis the organization's business initiative. This is the heart of the value creation identification process, identifying where the organization's source of value is, and then everything else, the data, the analytics, the instrumentation, the architecture, the technology, everything else falls out. But these things at the bottom here really don't have any value if you don't know what it is you're trying to accomplish, if you don't understand where within your customer organization value is created. So the first step in this process is that what we do to drive team empowerment is we make sure everybody in the organization not only understands what the mission statement is, but they also understand, number one, how is that creating value for our customers? And number two, what does that mean to them individually? The second part of team empowerment is establishing a common language. And we believe that common language is a language around the customer. We want to speak the customer's language. And so to do that, we've embraced this concept called design thinking. Okay, this is a fairly busy slide. You all have copies of the slides, so you can take a look at some more detail. But design thinking in its most basic sense is a highly nonlinear, almost seemingly random process, though it's not random, for how we collaborate with our customers to understand what it is they're trying to do, the jobs to be done, the sources of value, and the sources of impediments or pain. All right, so there's a process here. You empathize with your customers' needs. You define what they're trying to accomplish. You ideate potential solutions where you, you diverge before you converge. You prototype tests and that loops back constantly around each other here. So it's designed, as the slide says, to frame the opportunity and to drive a repeatable, scalable process for innovation. But you can't measure it linearly. You can't measure success of design thinking. You can't measure success, even sometimes your business models, by how many hours you put in, how many lines of code you've written, how many analytic models you've written. 
at the end, the only test that matters are customers willing to pay for and use what you're selling. And you have to have a process that's very iterative and sensitive because what this process is really geared around is learning faster than your competition. We like to say that the economies of learning for a knowledge-based industry are greater than the economies of scale. And more and more, every industry is becoming a knowledge-based industry. So we think about, we double click on this design thinking, there are some tools we like to use in this process. One is detailed persona profiles. So for each of our key stakeholders, we build a persona. We try to understand what jobs they do, what, what their gains are, that is what are the sources of value, what are the pains, that, what are the impediments. For each of our targeted personas, we build one of these and we'll have a lot of them, right? Because these provide vehicles for us which we can have a common language around the language of the customer. We then drill down into this to actually create a customer journey map to understand the steps that they go through to accomplish a certain task, maybe reduce unplanned operational downtime or to improve, reduce inventory costs or you know, to buy a house, depending on whatever your customer is, they go through a stage. And what we do is we try to take each of those steps that go in a stage and we break them down further to understand the gains and the pains. Now, what's really interesting about this process is the gains obviously make a lot of sense. You want to be able to focus and monetize on the gains. You, that's where the source of economic value is found. However, there's also a great opportunity to monetize pain. And I would argue that, that services like Uber do a great job of monetizing pain, the pain of trying to get from where you are to where you want to be without having to drive. Uber decided they're going to take that, that pain, that impediment, and they're going to monetize it. So it isn't just the gains that you can monetize and drive value from. Understanding the pains as well and solving those pains can also provide insights into how to drive more sources of value. Finally, it all comes together on this customer uh, solution map here where we bring together all we've learned about from each of our personas from the journey map and we start to create solutions. Understanding the products and services that we can provide, what the gain creators are and what the pain relievers are for each of those activities. So activity number two is about establishing a common language. And for us, that common language is the language of the customer, which we tease out using design thinking techniques. Oh, forgot about this chart. This is probably the single most powerful management tool that I have. And I made the comment earlier that organizations don't struggle because of a lack of use cases. They struggle because they have too many. And getting the group to agree, to collaborate on what use case we're gonna start with is a very tricky process. You need to have a process that allows every voice to be heard, that brings together all the key stakeholders and they have a chance to debate based on a value and feasibility, what use case we're gonna go after first. The reason why this process is important and the reason why the, each of your stakeholders need to be involved in this process is because the thing that kills most projects, more than technology, more than data, is passive aggressive behavior. If you don't cover off on all your key stakeholders and bring them into this process and get alignment as far as which use case, B, E, D, I, we think is the right place to start based on the value and feasibility weighting perspective, if you don't get everybody to agree on that, then you're not gonna have success. Passive aggressive behavior, again, kills more projects. And if we're trying to empower teams, we need to tease out that passive aggressive right up front so we can address it. Third thing, organizational improvisation or improv. Now you've all seen great soccer teams work together. In fact, you, many of you probably play on soccer teams. And watching the soccer game is actually watching almost like ballet that there are people moving to certain spots they have certain strategies and they and these players all interchange throughout the process here there's almost this sense of improvisation going on between the team sort of subtle communications and they all know who's taking lead at certain points who's going to do this and where they're supposed to go much like in the same way a great jazz quartet when they start to riff they, again, they, they improv, control, passes back and forth. They're, they're in alignment, but they don't have a plan. They're not reading off a script. They're not reading off a, you know, a, 
um, a sheet of music. They, they, they go back and forth. This, this beauty of organizational improv that we see in sports, we see in music, we see in comedy clubs, is really enabled because organizations understand and define the role that everybody plays. Right? Who plays what role? And understands the roles, responsibilities, and expectations of each of these. So that people in these sort of crossover areas can start to interchange themselves. So that the more that the data scientist and the data knows about data engineering, the more effective the data scientist can be. The more the business stakeholder knows about data engineering and data science, the more effective the business stakeholder can be. So it's about creating and defining these roles and responsibilities that allows us to have the foundation for organizational improv. And around that, we create a process, a very loosely leveled process that allows us, much like the design thinking process, for these teams to work together around a particular problem we're going after and start to brainstorm. In this case, using a fairly standard scientific method, with the only difference being that it's continuous process. It's always learning, always getting more effective. For us in the data science space, trying to predict what's likely to happen is almost a impossible task because you never know with 100% accuracy what is likely to happen. And so you have to build models in the case of data science that, that advance you and you only know in data science if your model is good enough if you know the cost of false positives and false negatives. By the way, this is the big challenge we're facing with the coronavirus. Understanding the cost of false positives and false negatives should help direct policy decisions regarding you know, who's being tested, how much we're doing, they're shutting down the economy. There's all these questions here. And unless you have thought through thoroughly those costs of false positives and false negatives, this highly iterative nonlinear process where these folks are all improving together doesn't know when good enough is good enough. Again, we're facing that problem today with the coronavirus because of lack of data and insights into what's going on and poorly defined false positives and false negatives. Now, what we do to help on the customer side, on the business stakeholder side, is we have a process called thinking like a data scientist. That is, we teach our business stakeholders, if I go back a couple of slides here to this slide, the business stakeholder folks, in order for, because they're the ones who understand where value is created, because they're the source of the economic value of a, of, in the relationship, we need to spend extra time helping them understand where and how data and analytics can derive new sources of value. I don't need my business stakeholders to know how to build a neural network, but they better understand at a high level how a neural network can help them address some of the problems that they have. To do that, what we do is we take our stakeholders through a process of teaching them how to think like a data scientist. And when we do this process, we find that the organizational improv increases dramatically that we have the ability now to pass more quickly between a data scientist, the data engineer, and the business stakeholders who have at their heart know the problem we're trying to solve. The one thing we have also done to help drive organizational improv is we create these we call innovation pods. Each of these pods is comprised of a very diverse set of personalities who all bring different skill sets and different, um, uh, different perspectives to the problem we're trying to solve. In this space here, when you're trying to drive innovation, diversity and conflict are your friends. You don't want a pod of people who all think the same way, who all have the same perspectives, because you won't learn anything new. It's important as you construct these pods, in this case for us data science pods, that we bring in people who have different perspectives, that we attack the group think aspect that dooms so many projects. And yes, we actually encourage debate, conflict, yelling and screaming is okay, pounding shoes on tables, going all Khrushchev is okay as well. But at the end, we have to collaborate back on what problem we're trying to solve. This is a very important process because one of the aspects of innovation is that an adage that we work with and live by is that all ideas are worthy of consideration. That all ideas are worthy of being considered. That does not mean that all ideas are worth a damn. In fact, most ideas probably aren't. But if you open up and bring in diverse opinions and you embrace conflict, you will find synergy. That one plus one doesn't only equal three, it equals seven, equals 70, equals 700. And so we create these data science pods purposely with the idea we're going to bring in different perspectives and create tension. And then what we do is the whole team of team concepts. 
that we can interchange people between pods based on the projects that are going on, that people can move seamlessly between these, much like what you see in a good soccer field or in a good basketball court or in a jazz club, that people move back and forth between these pods, helping out in certain ways. So much like Lord Nelson leveraged teams of teams by empowering each of his individual ships to make their own decisions, we empower each of these pods to make their own decisions and provide this organizational improv so we can move people between these pods as necessary. Finally, from an organizational perspective, if you can't operationalize all this, why bother? And so here's how we think about operationalizing and scaling innovation. It's a very simple three-step process that builds on everything we've talked about so far. First off, we use design thinking to identify, validate, value, and prioritize the sources of value creation. So this looks like a customer journey map, and what we've done is we've mapped the points of, of gains and the points of pains. We've, we've identified the points where value is created, and we've identified points where value is destroyed. Think about the merger of design thinking and economics on this chart. We're bringing in together so that we can really understand where value is created so we can focus on those areas of value creation. We can, as Stephen Covey would say, begin with an end in mind. We're not just throwing data at this. We're trying to understand where value is created and we're going to focus on those areas. We're trying to identify where value is destroyed and trying to focus on those areas. The second aspect is how do you codify value creation? For us, it's all about data science. Right? It's about starting with those decisions, understanding the metrics, predicting, prescribing, automating, right? and creating intelligent apps that continuously learn. Right? We codify what we learn into algorithms, not software, algorithms, because algorithms have the ability that they can continuously learn and grow. And we, have, we need to have that continuous learning and growing process because the world is constantly changing. New, new dynamics in consumer demand, new dynamics in economic variables, new healthcare concerns. And so you have to have, you codify those sources of value creation in algorithms. Third thing is how do we operationalize this? How do we pull this back into our organization's value chain? How does each part of what the organization does, how do we re-engineer the organization's value capture processes and integrate it back into the value chain or value network? Everything that we do should be analytics driven. All the policy decisions, all the, all the operational decisions, the manufacturing, assembly, logistics, distribution, even the products and services that we created to end, all should have the codification of value um, in them, the, in the form of algorithms. And by the way, this is a continuously looping process. You are never done. That might be good news, might be bad news. But the world is constantly changing. And again, as like I said earlier, we believe that the economies of learning are more powerful than economies of scale. That in the end, our ability as an organization to learn faster than our competition is how we're going to survive long term, is how we're going to digitally transform these industries. We're going to learn faster than our competition because we're going to spend time understanding upfront where the sources of value are by working closely using design thinking techniques and economics to really code, understand, identify those sources. We're going to leverage data science, AI and machine learning and reinforcement learning to start to build the algorithms that capture that, and then we're going to operationalize back those into the economics of the system. It's really that simple to do this, right? To drive digital transformation, you need to master these three things. Do two of the three things and you fail. You need to do all three of them. So um, I'm going to skip through this for a second. If we have time, I'll come back to it. I want to talk about what this means to you personally. So what is the message I deliver to my team? What is it I'm telling my team in order to make sure that, that team empowerment is highly dependent upon personal accountability. So the first step is I require my people to think critically. Now, duh, but it's not duh. In a world where opinions as fact blither as organizations and individuals in those organizations need to master the part of critical thinking. They need to think about what they're seeing, what they're being told, what they said, and to think about it. For example, never accept the initial answer as the right answer. Probably isn't. Spend the time to pause, think, and drive deeper. 
be skeptical of what you're, what you're seeing and learn to question. Like, consider credibility what you're being told. They don't get happy ears. That is, don't only seek what you're looking to reconfirm. In fact, look for things that run counter to what you're, what, what you're looking at. Embrace struggling as a way to take those alternative opinions and help you to learn more effectively. Obviously, stay curious. Try to understand what's out there and question things, right? Apply the reasonable test, reasonableness test. If you're told something, does that really make sense? No, the Pope did not vote in the last U.S. election, right? Think reasonable. Pause. We're so busy doing stuff. We're so busy to get to the next section, the next thing. Progress isn't measured by hours worked. You need to pause and think what you're trying to accomplish and contemplate and think before you move forward. And finally, the last point, maybe the most important point for us as a society, conflict is good. Conflict is the fuel for innovation. You bring different perspectives together and you meld them together. You synergize together and come up with something better. And that's, by the way, over a different lecture sometime, we can talk about how conflict can change an organization's economic value curve and how that can drive innovation. Here's a fun little infographic that you will, we won't go through, but you will have in the deck that kind of summarizes each of those points. And my last point here is about playing a video game and why team empowerment so much like playing a video game. What I learned about team empowerment, I learned by playing Final Fantasy II on my game board. Let me summarize this for you. First off, it takes a team to win. And the more diverse the team, the better. I want lots of different perspectives. I want somebody to be Tom Hanks and be big. You know, raise his hand and say, Bill, can I inter it. interrupt now, for a second? I want to have more of an opinion. I want a perspective on what they're talking about, but it takes a team, different per diverse perspectives, in order to be okay. successful. Number two, the path to Can I interrupt for a second, Bill? Path. I can't tell you exactly how we're going to get there. It may be this sort of way. And by the way, we may get partway there and realize that I'm actually not going there. I actually need to go over here. Number three, just playing the game doesn't help you win. Okay. Just playing doesn't help you win. You've got to think. you got to... You got to have a plan, process by process, define, try, fail, adapt, advance, and as you move, again, you will move like this. But each step of the way, you will learn. And by the way, the next point: failing is how we learn. If you aren't failing enough, you're not learning enough. You're not pushing enough. Learning is failing is how we learn. And you'll have a hypothesis, and you'll test that, and realize, oop, that's wrong, and you have to come back and start over again. That's okay. Failing is Bill, how we learn. Bill, can I interrupt for a second? Point to me is a real critical one. Everyone has to be prepared to take a turn and lead. Everyone needs to be prepared to step up. Depending on the situation, it may require different skill sets, different perspectives to someone else who can step up and lead the process. It isn't led by one person at the top. The command and control style of business management is death. It's given huh? way to empower teams where everyone really? on that team is willing to step up and take their turn, even if they're not sure they can lead. Embrace on learning. And can you hear me? Think you know the answers? I don't want you in my team. If you think you already know the answers, I don't want you in my team. I want people on my team who, who are willing to challenge the holy gospel of ideas they've had and say that may not be true. I think one of the biggest problems we see in the older leadership, at least in the U.S. here, is that they've learned certain ways to run businesses and they can't unlearn what has got to change. And that dooms those organizations. Those organizations that were listed in that early chart about digital transformation, who was being overrun, who was being having their business models disintermediated, was because they didn't unlearn about what was going on in order to learn something new. Remember, if you're climbing a ladder, at some point, you need to let go of that rung below you to reach up to the next part. And finally, collaboration is everything. No one wins the battle by themselves. It takes a team. And by the way, we all stand on each other's shoulders. So in the end, from my perspective, is analytics-driven innovation the ultimate oxymoron? I say not. I say if analytics is based on the fact that I'm trying to establish a common mission and understand a common value creation process, or 
We're trying to establish a common language using design thinking around the customer by embracing organizational improv and empowering teams to be more interactive and more reflective. If I'm leveraging all this to scale innovation so I can learn faster than my competition, and I'm also holding everybody personally accountable for driving this, then analytics-driven innovation is not the ultimate oxymoron. I would argue that analytics-driven innovation and the ability to make better decisions, operational business and policy decisions is the new norm. It's the new normal. It's how organizations are going to survive and learn faster than their competition. That's it for me. I did it all in 35 minutes like I was instructed. So, Martin, uh, Q&A, is that where we're going to go next? Yeah, we'll try, we'll try a little bit of Q&A if we can. Uh, Was my sound okay? I saw my headphone just went dead. I think the headphones just uh, might have lost the connection. It might have been coming through the laptop there for a little while. But um, I think most people could hear you pretty well. So... All right, sorry about that, folks. I was warned that this was going to happen, so my my first time. So I, again, I apologize that um, um, I should have yelled more. All right, That's fine, I'll, I'll learn and get better at this. No need. Okay. No, no, yeah, I don't think it was. Uh, let me just put up the chat here. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, Rosemary. Can you can you hear us? Because I, I think your mic yeah. is great. A lot of um, interference there. Can you? Can you? Oh, use sorry. This? I checked. Yeah. Unless you have a question. <laughs> okay. So if, if somebody has a question for Bill, um, just unmute your mic and uh, and away you go. Hi, Bill. Thank you very much for for the excellent lecture. I have a question in terms of trying to already have a value. Um, weaved into the initial whole process. How, how do you balance out still having the massive innovation in the beginning and having an open discussion and still having a product kind of driven design in, in the whole approach? Do you think that's dif difficult to balance or how, how do you balance that one out? So make, make sure I understand. It's a good question. Let me make sure I understand. So how do I balance out a innovative ideation approach when in the end I need to make sure I deliver a product at the end. Is that sort of, is that the, did I catch that right? Yes, exactly. You formulated the question way better than I could. All right, good. No, you it, it, So it all starts with management. If, if you, if you don't have um, a senior management and I'm going to be really blunt, right? It doesn't respect, the different skill sets that people bring to the problem, I think it's really hard for the individual to not only have impact, but what I find frustrating is I can't see my fingerprints on the organization. And so it really does have to start with senior management who wants to embrace this idea like Lord Nelson did, that we need to think differently. The old command and control structure doesn't work anymore and we need to embrace and empower teams. So if you have that, if you have leader, senior leadership who says we need to do things differently, I think what you'll find is that that ideation process where you, you diverge with ideas but you have to converge at some point back, back with an idea and that prioritization matrix that I showed will become the critical vehicle that helps you to move forward idea by idea. So I, I don't think, I think, I know firsthand product organizations can do that. But we do it because we have the senior leadership of the organization the belief that everybody is worthwhile, that all ideas are worthy of consideration, and that the, the, the intelligence of the organization less and less is found at the senior levels of the, of the organization and is found more and more at the points of customer engagement and operational engagement. It's not in the vice president of marketing it's in the clerks in the store who are working with customers. It's with the technicians in the factory who are fixing things. And when you have that kind of transition, the smarts is no longer here, but is over here, that's a good sign the organization will be successful. All right, thank you very much. Yep, very good, thanks. 
Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Oh, very good. So, uh, by, by the way, hello from Seattle. <laughs> um, oh, hey, Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> so, I had a question back whenever you were talking about um, communicating the values um, through, your, through your chain at the beginning. Um, I know it varies from organization to organization, but what do you find is the best way to communicate those values in order for people to actually absorb them rather than dismiss them? Values meaning the organization's mission statement or the understanding where value is created within your customer environment? Oh, no. I'm um, sorry. Mission statement wise. Okay. Um, I, I um, once had a student of mine. We were doing this digital transformation class. And her recommendation was in trying to make that digital transformation come to life for everybody in the company, that everybody get a Fitbit and wear a Fitbit around so that they personally would go through a transformation and understand then what that meant to the organization. And so my, my answer is, is the challenge is the organization, this is up to each leader in the organization, needs to make certain that the mission statement is real for even the lowest people in the organization, that everybody in the organization can see how what they are doing impacts the overall mission of the organization. L let me give an example of one thing that we've done. So the one thing that I think most organizations do really crappy are meetings. Most meetings absolutely suck. They're a total waste of time. And time and time again, I've been called in the meetings that I was not, I shouldn't have been there. Didn't, wasn't prepped in the right way. It's you know, an hour of people droning on and you walk out with no clear understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. To address that, we created what we call a meeting design canvas. And for any major meeting, what you need to do is you need to make sure that meeting in the canvas in the lower left panel has a, in that panel says, how does this meeting impact our mission statement? How does it tie back to our strategic initiatives? And that little change has helped us to transform meetings. First of all, we cut the number of meetings down dramatically, but now the meetings themselves have meaning because I understand how this meeting I'm going to, how what I'm doing in this meeting is gonna impact different parts of the strategy. So I, I hope that at least that's how we've tried to address it and bring it down to the individual. Cause it's no good. If only the senior executives know what you're trying to accomplish and no one down in the working bee part can, can personalize it, then you're probably in trouble. Okay. Thank you. Bill? Yeah. Bill, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I've got, I've got a question from Emma. She has a little bit of background noise. So she just asked me to uh, relay the question. All right. Okay. So I can ask Bill, um, how, do, how do the organization manage their focus of their operational goals with generating that many ideas consistently? So how, how does your organization manage their focus on the operational goals? you're generating uh, so many ideas consistently. So um, I think we've got that right, Emma. It, yeah. Thumbs up here. Yeah, it's, it's a great yeah. question. In fact, how do, you, how do you balance ideation with, product, with, you know, with a certain extent with the reality, reality of the business? It may be the most difficult challenge, and there is no right answer. It, it's a balance question. Sometimes you'll ideate maybe more than you need to. Sometimes you'll develop more than you need to. The only guide that I recommend is I always use the customer as my vehicle. If, if the ideation process isn't creating things that have value to the customer, that is if we can't I've been test rapidly with customers, then there's no need to go to the product side, right? So there is the, the customer in the middle of this process is everything. Now, that may seem really, oh, duh, Schmarzo, that's, you know, the customer should be in the middle. I can't tell you how many organizations don't put the customer in the middle. And in fact, what they also don't do is put the customer's customers in the middle. For example, um, I'm doing, my team is doing a very big project with a very large theme park in Orlando, Florida. You can probably guess what it is. Um, and we're trying to help, we're trying to help them to reduce unplanned operational downtime and all this sort of stuff. If we only focused on that, we'd have some level of success. But what we've done is we said, for each of the guests, how does unplanned operational downtime 
impact each of the guests and the guest experience. <coughs> Excuse me. When we start to factor in not only the customer, but the customer's customers, now we have a better guardrails around which our ideation process can bounce because we now have the customer's customers who can tell us, you know, when do was an idea useful and when is it just not really relevant to them at all? So I would say that the best way to make sure the ideation stays within guardrails, not railroad tracks, but guardrails, is first off, yes, embrace the customer, but also if you really want to get good, embrace the customer's customers and look at how that, that value chain or value network impacts them and use that to help frame the guardrails around what you're doing your ideation. Great. Thank you, Walter, talking too much. No, no, that's great. Any other questions? Hey, Will. Uh, I have a question on uh, on the prioritization. So, like as you said, there are there so there are lots of ideas which are generated within a team. How do you prioritize between those ideas? Is it like you use the model which you said about uh, that focus on the customers, or or is it whether those ideas align to the mission statement? Uh, how do you how do you strike the right balance and and find the sweet spot? Oops. So um, I was going to try to find that prioritization matrix again. Let me let me do this. Um, I, I made the comment, and hopefully you can see this, that this prioritization matrix, where I'm measuring value and feasibility from low to high is a tool that we use. Now we, we have um, a business initiative we're going after. Again, it might be improved customer experience, customer retention, whatever it might be. And we always, by the way, we capstone, usually say between nine to 12 months time frame. The reason why I put time to 12 months is because if I have infinite time, I can solve any problem, but I need to, I need to create a sense of urgency for lack of a better term, I need to light somebody's hair on fire to really get motivated. And so what happens is you look at this, you're gonna have a whole number of use cases through your ideation process. You're gonna find all kinds of ideas of use cases that can help you to address, let's say the unplanned downtime is an issue we're going after. All right, you're gonna have all kinds of ideas and you're gonna to want to go through a process with all the stakeholders, bring them all in the room. It might be 15, 20 people and go through a process of putting those things on post-it notes and debating where they all sit vis-a-vis -vis each other and having debate about, you know, why is B more valuable than A? Why is A more feasible than B? Why does E, which is the senior vice president's pet project, have such a low feasibility? And if you bring all the stakeholders together and you literally, you'll gather them around a flip chart with these post-it notes and you'll debate and argue and conjole and fight about where do each of these things stand. Now, when we do this process, we're always looking at the organization's financial drivers. That is, what is the organization really trying to accomplish? It's always about you know, improving uh, operational, reducing operational costs, improving customer satisfaction, improving customer retention. There's probably a number of different financial variables that we're gonna use to try to measure this against. But in the end, even though we have the financial drivers as the frame for it, in the end, it's about getting people to agree to move forward. And for example, in this example, you may decide you're gonna start with C because it's the only solution everybody can agree to. And as you do C, maybe you say we're going to do C first, and then once you do C, then we're going to do A. And then by the time we do A, by the way, E might, start to, might have started to march across, become more feasible. So we use this as a vehicle to bring all the stakeholders together. Again, it's very important you have all the stakeholders there, because if you don't have all the stakeholders there, then your, your, your passive-aggressive behavior can get you. If you leave off a stakeholder who's not in this workshop, who's not there, nodding their head and agreeing with you, and later on they can say, well, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to agree with it, then the whole process is wasted. So this is my favorite tool. I've been using this for, I've been in this industry a really long time. And I've been using this in every situation to help me drive alignment about where we're going to start. Because it isn't about where I think they should start. It's about where they think they should start based on the value and feasibility decision. 
Great. Any other questions? I think we have a couple of minutes left, Bill, before you have to get back to work. Yeah, I, I just keep checking to make sure my headphone's still working. That's my, I'm now very paranoid about that. No, it's working Sarah perfectly Jane. fine, Ralph. Um, so can, yeah. can you hear me, Martin? Yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, I, I work in digital transformation myself, and, and I think a really interesting point that has come up is organizations struggle with digital transformation as, as a topic, you know, going from business as usual and embarking on a transformation journey. And now with what we've seen around um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the way businesses have had to reorganize, um, I'm just wondering, do you think we're going to go back to go forward because businesses are now going to have to react to always being online and, you know, running their businesses much differently? That's a great question. That is a lot of really good questions. I appreciate it. I, by the way, this is the best part of this session for me is the Q&A. I mean, me presenting, snore. I mean, I've seen it's my presentation, but that's a really interesting question. So here's my prediction. My prediction is that the smart organizations are going to learn that, that you can have empowered teams work remotely. And in fact, there may be lots of substantial benefits by having these, the, the, the skill sets we're learning now and how to work remotely, the skill sets you're learning about how to take classes remotely are gonna benefit you going forward. Just, just look at classes alone. We know there's a wealth of knowledge out across the internet and such. Some really, really smart people are sharing all kinds of brilliant stuff. and it, it, the old way to learn is that you, you, you bought a book and you read it, right? Now I can consume things more differently. I can learn differently. And I think that the, if I really believe in my heart that the organizations that are going to be successful are the ones that can learn, fail, and relearn more quickly than other ones, I think its ability to do remote things and to learn remotely and to collaborate remotely will help distinguish those organizations that will be successful from those that don't. I think the companies that go back to the old way of doing things are going to get overrun by the companies that have said, oh my God, I've unlearned how we can have meetings. I've unlearned how we can do events. I've unlearned we can do things differently. It, and at the end of the day, what it does is it allows the organizations to change their economic value curve, to transform how value is, is created. It, and in essence, the economic value curve is transformed with a really simple concept, do more with less. That's how you transform the economic value curve. Well, we're learning how to do more with less. We're, we're having these remote meetings, remote lectures and training at a fraction of the cost we had before. And not only is it more inexpensive, but now you have access to a whole wider variety of people from which you can learn from. So great question. I actually think the companies that are gonna thrive are the ones who come out of this realizing that it's not business as, as usual, that there are new ways to do things and we're gonna unlearn all those old ways and learn and embrace these new ways to create new sources of value and learning. Thank you. And a great answer. Um, I think we have time for one more question, maybe. Sure. Make sure my headphone's still working. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I might jump in. So no one's. I just interested in the design thinking and and maybe customers that you've seen do it well. Maybe any techniques that you've used, and possibly we need to revisit in light of your last answer. If we need to think maybe how we do things going forward, but just if you have any tips there around the design thinking process. Yeah. So design thinking is um, it's one of those terms that is easily misused and misunderstood. And what I mean by that that to a certain extent, design thinking is a, is a mix-in. Design thinking doesn't write software, but it does make software development better. Design thinking doesn't do data science, it makes data science better. Design thinking is one of the, these, these skill sets that makes everything else better because it forces you to think and talk the customer's language. Um, I, 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 was, I, didn't even, I didn't know much about design thinking two years ago. There were some things that I had used over the past 30, 40 years that were design thinking like stuff that just I use naturally, like the prioritization matrix. That's something I've used forever. 
because I started getting into design thinking, I realized what it forced me to do is it forced me to really understand the customer. And from an economic perspective, that's where value is created. So what we've done is we've uniquely, I think, to, at least in our organization, we've brought together design thinking, economics, and then if I had another hand, the whole idea of, of analytics and data science to really figure out how we create value. So I, I really believe that every organization needs to understand design thinking techniques. It won't replace what you do. It just, it, it'll make everything more effective because it, not only does it fuel this ideation process, we call that to the divergence process, but when you come back to the customer conversation, you come back with a better understanding of where value is. And let's be really clear, in every business, the only place the only place where value is actually created is with the customer. Everybody else, the agents, the brokers, the distributors, right, the retailers, it's, yeah, all the value comes from the customer. My theme park that I work with, right, it's, the theme park isn't valuable, it's the customers by virtue of coming to the theme park and spending money for, you know, lots of money for lots of things that drives value. So um, I think every organization, at every, I think every university and every college needs to have a design thinking layer in it. And the organizations that I think are the absolute best, the one who I think is the best, well, there's a lot of them that are really good. Apple is, is rock solid at this. SAP is outstanding at doing this. And it changes how they interact with people. Um, I know Xerox and Cisco have done a lot of stuff in the space. Ericsson is doing stuff in the space. So there are organizations that are kind of starting to bubble up and do more and more of this. Uh, but every university, needs to have some level of design thinking, not just within one school, but across all the schools so they all can speak and think the same language of the customer. All right, let's turn on my video. Can you hear us? There you are. Nope, you were there a second. Yeah, okay, we're back again, I hope. So Bill, thanks a million. That was really fascinating. Um, I personally have pages of notes here that I've been frantically scribbling away at while, uh, while listening to you. Um, every minute you go on, you're adding fresh insights and it's, it's really been a fascinating hour. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think there have been uh, layers of insights on uh, the story that you've just told us. It's been a fascinating uh, little peek at what it is that you do and the value that you, you bring to, to your organization. Um, I love hearing when somebody says I've got a, a favorite framework, the one right there behind you on, on screen, because um, it, it brings across that idea of systems thinking and a systems approach to, to problem solving, which is really at the heart of we're trying to go with a module in terms of team empowerment, but from that systems perspective. So everything from the, the idea of smart organizations will figure out how to do this uh, better in, in the future, to your pods, to the examples that you were giving, to the structure that you, get, you gave us in, in the presentation. It's, it's, all been, it's all been really fascinating and a fantastic addition to the module. I can't really thank you enough. Well, thank you, Martin. I, I love the opportunity. Um, I'm sorry about the headset thing. And every time we do this, we'll get better at it. I'm, I'm unlearning so I can learn again. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And as I said to you in our little build up, uh, you're a much nicer guy than Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't have Starbucks, so that's a big difference. <laughs> okay, Bill, well, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you everybody. Much. Thank you. Super. Thank you. 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 Thank you.